Ooh, that looks tasty. Quick, the realm's in danger. I need a new axe and a helmet and a shield. Quick, before we're all doomed. An axe, a helmet, and a shield. Yes, yes, of course, of course, I can handle that for you. That's only gonna be 74 gold. You know what? For you, because I like the cut of your jib, 72 gold. And as soon as you pay that up front, I can get those for you. Welcome, folks. Today, the Hunger Gamer is back with another game review. And today, we are talking about Merchants of Magic, a set of watch tale designed by Clarence Simpson and published by Rock Manor Games. And before I begin, please make sure you turn your Klingon subtitles, because if I make any errors in the rules overview, that's where you'll find those corrections. Additionally, I do need to point out that this is an advanced copy of the game. There is a couple of slight changes made to the final version, mostly with the, the dice here, but I do believe everything else is as the game should be. So what Merchants of Magic is, is it is, it is a game set in the Set of Watch universe, and which is a, well, a fantasy universe in which you have the heroes going out and doing amazing heroic things. But of course, to do that, they're going to need gear in order to go out and save save the kingdom from darkness or whatever it is that's coming at them. And to do that, you are doing a roll and write style game. And in this roll and write style game, each player runs their own little magic shop, and you're basically just trying to make the most money off of these adventurers as you possibly can, so they can then go out and save you and your shop from all the monsters that are out there. If you are not interested in how this game is played, just wanna jump into my final thoughts, do you wanna go to the timestamp on the screen right? Now, for those of us still here, let's run through how this game works. So what we have here are is we have our mat here, which is all the different sheets. First thing you're gonna do is you gotta name yourself. So we will be ye old with an E, of course, magic shop with two P's and an E, because you know that's how you do. And what we have up here is we have our different orders that exist right now in our shop. That's what people are in there looking to buy. And at the end of each round, what's gonna happen is the one furthest on the left is going to go off to another player and they will have that and then you'll be getting a new one. So you're gonna constantly have a slight cycle through of different goods that you're gonna be able to, to make. Additionally, each player has a sponsored adventurer and they're in and they have three orders that they very much want. In this case, the bounty hunter wants the everlasting ring, the everlasting warhammer, and the everlasting helmet. He wants all those and so you can come in and you have those orders always there. You can always make those three. Then over here, we have two masteries that you can get. And again, they're worth points. And what's happening is it's telling you, for example, the woodsman wants to mark five circles in the wood column, which is here. So if you've marked five of these circles, you're gonna be able to claim this. And this one is four wild energy. So if you've marked four circles here, you're gonna be able to claim that. Then once it gets claimed, it flips over and it's less points for other people. But the core of the game is your roll and write. And so what's gonna happen is you're gonna start and you're gonna roll your four dice. And then everybody is going to have the same numbers. And so once you have rolled those numbers, I think I just moved that one, you're gonna take them and you are going to write them down here. So in this case, we have two, an eight, a six, and a 10. And then you can just kind of put those to the side. And then what's gonna happen is you're going to then place two of these numbers somewhere on here. And on this side of the board, you have to get that number or higher, while on this side of the board, it's that number or lower, right? And up here, it tells you which type of dice you can use in that particular column. I think I said row earlier, I meant column. So for example, here you can use the red, the purple, or the yellow. Well, here you can use the purple, the yellow, or the green. That's just going to limit what it is you're able to do. Now you're gonna notice in some places, like down here, that's an eight. Well, you can't get an eight on a six. And I'll explain how you get that in just a moment. But on your turn, you're going to use two of these numbers. So just for the sake of argument, let's say I wanna use my purple eight that I have. So maybe I will go and I will fill in the staff here. Good for me. I now have made stabs in my shop. I can do that. I always have access to any kind of staff. And then I'll go and I'd put a little check mark over there. That's for some in-game scoring. In addition to that, I will get a single potion. Potions are used to either add one or subtract one from any number that you've rolled. So as I said, I've used that eight there, but I also have this 
green 10. Well, maybe I really want to get this everlasting here, which is good for this guy right here. I'm getting towards my everlasting stuff. So I can take this one potion I have, I can spend it and make my 10 a nine, and I can fill that in like that. And I'm halfway to getting the everlasting. The other thing that you're gonna be using potions for is I've said you can only spend two dice each turn. Well, that's not always true. You can also check these off here and that will allow you to spend another die. So if I had spent done that there, then I could also say spend this yellow six and maybe I will use that and do this right here. Now I've done the six there and you get the idea. However, the fourth, fifth and sixth time that you do that is going to cost you potions. The only other thing that I'll take a moment and just point out is down here, these are basically bonuses that are gonna be in-game scoring condition bonuses that you're gonna get during the game. Now, I also mentioned your adventurer. Every time you fulfill one of their orders, you're gonna check the one of these boxes off here and you're going to get bonuses as you go through and you do that. But basically the idea is you're filling out these, these rows here in order to have access to that. So for example, if I want to make the helmet of the dwarves, I would have had to mark off my one helmet thing here on a turn, and also these two right here. And now anything that comes up into my shop that is of the dwarves, I can now make. And then anything that is a helmet, I can now make, or I can also now make anything that is a staff. And so you get the idea and you're slowly, as you're going through building up what it is that you have access to in your shop, cards are cycling through and you are making as many orders as you can. Then at the end of the game, you're simply going to add up all your points. You're going to add up all the things that you've checked off here, all the things that you've checked off here, whatever extra bonuses that you're getting right here based off of what you've made. Then you're going to get points for any masteries that you've accomplished. And then of course, you're going to get points for if you've achieved all of the orders of your adventurer and then whatever orders that you have done. You're gonna get points for all of those things and then total it up, high score wins. So what do I like about this game? Now, before I say anything, I will say that I am not necessarily a big roll and write guy. So take everything that I'm saying with a little bit of a grain of salt because I'm not a roll and write master by any stretch of the imagination. But I will say, I enjoy this game. I think it is just, for someone who is not a huge Roll and Write fan, is just the right level of thought that goes into it. And what I mean by that is, while yes, in a Roll and Write game, there are so many options and you're trying to figure out what it is that you wanna do, there's not unlimited options. And I think that comes from, you just it's these four dice and you're only using two. And so you're immediately being limited with the amount of choices that you have in many ways. And you can see, all of the orders that are out there at any given moment. So you know what you can make. So you know what you're targeting. You see what's on the other side of the table and is coming around to you. And then every time something gets filled, it goes an upside down, but then it pretty quickly flips over. And so you know what you're targeting. So again, that also makes it a little bit easier because while these cards do start cycling through, they don't cycle through at an insane pace, at least not in the multiplayer game. They, they, go, they cycle through quicker in the single player game. And so for that, I really enjoy that. And I like the simplicity of the game. It's very simple. You have dice, they are rolled. It tells you right here what types of dice you can use, it tells you right there, you need a three or above over here. It tells you two or below. Very, very simple. You fill out a row and then that's it. It's not like you, you're going to spend it and lose it. It's there. It's done. You have it. Great. And so everything is pretty darn simple and pretty quick. And that leads to games that go quickly. Now, I played this with my wife and I taught her the game. We played through the game in about 45 minutes. Now that sounds like, oh, that's fine. But what you don't understand is, now I would never accuse my wife of analysis paralysis ever, but she definitely carefully considers her gaming options regularly. I'll put it that way. But still, even with teaching and playing, still only 45 minutes, which means it's quick. This is a game that's not going to overstay. It's welcome. And so when you bring all of that together, the simple fun and joy of picking where you want to go, what it is that your shop can make, and that is kind of fun. I do like that, that once I've done both of these here, ye old magic shop here is known as a place that has everlasting stuff. Anybody, now literally anybody who wants an everlasting staff can come get it or an everlasting helmet, they can come get it because I got it. And that is fascinating because it leads to a little bit of you're looking around the table of figuring, okay, well, they're able to make this over there. So that means 
all this stuff that's about to get to them, they're probably going to take. So I should go another direction. And you kind of start to have these really different shops out there, which kind of makes sense. That's kind of what I imagine you would have in this fantasy world. You, you go to different places for different things. And to me, to me, that is fun. I do enjoy that. I also really do think the way these potions work as mitigation is, is really, really good because it's so simple. They're so easy to get. You, by the end of the game, you have a ton of these things. And then, of course, by the end of the game, then you're actually just kind of burning through these things. Like, oh my gosh, I rolled a one on my 10-sided die and I actually needed a nine. Well, that's okay, because I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight potions. Done. Now I have nine. And to me, that is just so silly and so much fun because you have that thing at the end of the game you always come down to how horrible it is if you have a last roll that you can't do anything with that's terrible but these potions help mitigate that is it possible to still wind up with the turn that you can't do anything of course it is but it just it doesn't happen as much because of the way those potions work so all around i think this is a very tight game that works really pretty darn well. So what are my quibbles with the game? The first one is, and I'm going to be a little nitpicky on, on this here. The first one is some of these adventurers, I question their shopping habits, right? Like some of them make sense. Like you have the orc, the barbarian that's getting an ax and a helmet and stuff like that. But then you have something like the witch here. Why is the witch buying plate armor? Does it look like she's wearing plate armor? It does not look like she's wearing plate armor. And I mean, I know, I know I'm being nitpicky, but if I'm jumping into a fantasy world, I really want it to pop. I want to immerse myself into it. And I know that I am doing paperwork. This is a game about paperwork because it's a roll and write game, but I want to feel like I'm running this shop. And I guess I could convince myself that I'm such a good used car salesman, a used armor salesman that I can sell a witch plate armor that she's not actually going to use. But to me, it just, it doesn't make as much sense. And I'm sure it has to do because of the number here and the difficulty of getting that. But for me, what well, why isn't which getting bracers or something like that? So again, that's very nitpicky, but it speaks to the world. If this is a set of watch tale, and I used to own the first set of watch. I played, played it quite a bit before it, it moved on to somebody else who really wanted it. And I enjoyed set of watch and I enjoyed that little universe they were creating. But if we're going to be in that universe, I want it to pop. I wanted to really show me that universe. And to me, just little things like that don't quite jive for me. Now, you might not even notice it. And it's very obvious that you might not care, but just something that popped out for me. And at the same time, I, I wish that the artwork on these was more different. I mean, some, some of them are. There are some examples, like with the swords here, that look different. And that's awesome. But then you have times like this, where other than a slightly different shade, they look exactly the same. And again, if the only real immersion into the story that I am getting is the cards and the cool items I'm making, I just wish they all looked more different. Because otherwise, I'm just doing paperwork. With all that said, those are two very nitpicky things. And that only coming around because, well, really, I, I want to feel like I'm in this world. And that might not matter to you a lick because the mechanics of this game are good. The mechanics are fun. It's enjoyable and I'm certainly going to play this more and more. And I'm actually a little bit sad that I've now messed up this page because that's one less time that I get to play this game. So there you have it, folks. That is Merchants of Magic. I think if you like roll and write games and you like fantasy games and you like this kind of idea of running this shop, then I, I think this is very fun. I think it's fast. I think it's quick. You can play with a lot of players. And it truly is, I think, an enjoyable game and one that I can absolutely recommend with my limited knowledge of roll and write games. Do I have a few quibbles with some of the theme immersion? I do. But those are truly, truly quibbles. I think this is, I think this might be my favorite game I've played from Rock Manor Games. I haven't played a ton of them, but but I have played a couple, and this one might be my favorite one, and this one's definitely my wife's favorite one. So there you have it, folks. If I made any mistakes in the rules overview, please let me know in the comments with the timestamp. I'll get that into the Klingon subtitles. As always, if you found this video useful, please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.